Welcome to Clocking In, Voices of NC Manufacturing. I'm your host, Phil Mintz, Director of the North Carolina Manufacturing Extension Partnership, otherwise known as NCMEP. My role is to drive outreach to NC manufacturers, build relationships to federal and state leaders, and coordinate efforts to drive profitable manufacturing growth in North Carolina. Throughout my time working closely with manufacturers, I have heard the most quirky, curious, and memorable stories. I wanted to turn these stories into a podcast so that others may hear and be informed and inspired. From humble beginnings to manufacturing titans, from tragedy to triumph, I will be interviewing some of these manufacturers who have made North Carolina manufacturing the powerhouse that it is today. Today we're clocking in with a media voice of North Carolina manufacturing. Business North Carolina, based in Charlotte, was founded in 1981. In 2012, it won a gold award for the nation's best regional business magazine from the Alliance of Area Business Publications. The magazine follows the pulse of many key industries in the state, including manufacturing, health care, and also is a focus of the small business community. Business North Carolina is a partner with North Carolina Manufacturing Extension Partnership in hosting the annual MFG Con, the North Carolina Manufacturing Conference. Ben Kenny, who has been a publisher at Business North Carolina since 2003. Ben has a BA in history from NC State University, and he got his early start in the newspaper industry and display advertising sales at the News and Observer. Ben, thank you for taking time with us to speak today. How are you doing? Doing good, Phil. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. You got, me, you got me an excuse to come into the office today. Yeah, absolutely. So you guys are essential. I mean, obviously, we're in some weird times. As, the, as, as of this recording, the nation is being gripped by what I guess will be called the pandemic of 2020, although the coronavirus is discovered in 2019. You know, the governor has issued these stay-at-home orders that are allow only essential businesses to travel. So how is Business North Carolina operating in the midst of all of this? So about a month and a half ago before, and we're based in Raleigh, um, our main, uh, we have a location in um, a small sales office in, excuse me, we have a small sales office in Raleigh and we're based here in Charlotte. And so about a week before they actually shut the city down, when Mecklenburg County uh, called for a shutdown, we actually went ahead and took the initiative uh, to, to start working from home when we could. And so it's pretty easy for us, you know, for an edit, from the editorial standpoint, the editors, they can do that in a, in a fairly simple manner. You know, wherever they have a laptop and we all use the cloud now, we're not as reliant on the server uh, as, as, as we used to be. So it's not that big a deal. Our sales staff is usually remote most of the time anyway, and they kind of come in once every couple of days before this. So it hasn't been that hard uh, for us. The real issues, the real difficult portions of it are when we have to get together to put the magazine all together before it goes up to the publisher for printing. And so there's a lot of editing and checking facts and grammar and all that kind of stuff. And we still have to do it old school. So we just got done uploading our, our May issue yesterday to the printer. And so everybody was in the office at a safe distance, but just doing a lot of proofing. So if you can see the dust, it's starting to settle behind me. <laughs> is it all COVID, uh, the, May, the May magazine? How, how much of it is in there? Yes and no. Um, uh-huh. Being a magazine is very different than uh, daily news, a newspaper or TV or radio. You know, we're not going to get the, we're not going to break any news in a magazine. What our, and this is for any story that we do, we basically will take a, a headline, go behind that headline and have a real thought out piece behind it. Who are the major players, you know? Uh, what is the impact on the economy as a result of that? And then we'll talk to critics of, of, of something or, and, or allies of it as well. So we can give you a real thought out story based on a headline. Uh, with coronavirus, we've had about a month under our belt. And uh, one of our columnists, the great Dan Barkin, uh, wrote a uh, very uh, thoughtful analysis of how it's affected businesses that I think people will really enjoy. And essentially, you know, pandemics are in uh, a lot of uh, people's minds in terms of CEOs. It's something that's always in there when they're planning out their year. And we talk a little bit about some of the CEOs and companies that have had this 
you know, built into uh, a lot of their mission statements and things like that. So it, it's a pretty thoughtful read, I think. And it, especially is how it affects business. And that's the yeah. key thing that we tried to uh, differentiate ourselves from the other news media. That's a good, there's a good place for them to do that, but we think we have a niche that we can fill with the economic impact of this. Yeah, good. We'll talk more maybe about that in a minute. You know, it seems like publishing and journalism are in the Kinney DNA. You know, were you involved as a kid growing up and did you always know this is what you wanted to do? I, absolutely not, man. And I'll tell you, <laughs> this is the thing is that, so I grew up in, in the seventies as a kid, I was the son child of a newspaper man. And so back then, it was really like being the son of, like an army brat, quite frankly. New, uh, reporters and editors basically went where the work was and where they could just kind of keep going up the hierarchy in terms of better newspapers, better gigs, uh, better content they could cover from that standpoint. So we moved around quite a bit. First around the state, I was born in Burlington, but we moved over to Winston-Salem. And then my father got a, a, a fellowship at Columbia University for business journalism. We moved to uh, New York City for a time period as well. He got that. Then we moved down to South Florida and Fort Lauderdale, and he worked for the Miami Herald down there. And finally, we moved back to Charlotte when he uh, took the gig at Business North Carolina, and he was then their editor. But we just went where the work was. And I, that's a little bit different than, than, than workforce today. And I can, you, you talk to some of the younger people about it, and they kind of, what are you talking about? You know what I mean? Uh, we, you know, uh, we, we like to see, you know, folks like to stay where they are, it seems like to me here, especially when you're in North Carolina, uh, this great state. It's like, well, uh, you know, I, I don't want to leave my schools where my kids are and all that kind of stuff. And man, I moved all over the place and went to a bunch of different schools growing up. And, and, and so that, that was kind of the deal with the, the newspaper aspect of it. I never thought anything about what he did or anything like that. You know, it's just he was he was he was gone quite a bit and covered some really weird stories. And and a bunch of his friends were really strange people. You know, <laughs> reporters are a weird lot. And they really were weird in the 70s and 80s, let me tell you, especially the Miami Herald. So we, when we moved back here, I went to NC State uh, with the full intention of following my mom's footsteps of being uh, a high school teacher. And in between my side gig when I was at, uh, at State was I worked for the News and Observer as they owned Business North Carolina at the time. And it, I had a pretty good gig working for newspapers and education. Uh, newspapers and education gig, which was uh, kind of the, the getting newspapers involved in uh, public education and how you can use those effectively. I uh, did it part time and I eventually got a sales job uh, selling advertising for the NNO and found out I was pretty good at it. And I ended up not uh, doing the teaching route and staying at the NNO for 10 years doing sales, advertising sales for them. I switched over. Um, my dad asked me to become uh, the sales manager for Business North Carolina. For the Triangle area, I lived up there for a while and, uh, and and did that, and it was it was a great run. And then we had a tragedy uh, where we had a uh, general manager for Business North Carolina died unexpectedly in a plane crash in 2001, and I ended up moving back here to help out my family and stayed stayed ever since. We've been through different ownerships and things like that, uh, but I'm still publisher. But initially, initially, what I did was I was just coming and help out the family, you know, in terms yeah. of. Time. And, and, and it worked out well. It's, it's helped me out in the sense that I really enjoy being out and talking to business owners and people across the state. That is a really fulfilling thing. Half the reason I'm going stir crazy now is I'm not on the road as much as I was out and talking yeah. to people. Uh, it makes it really difficult, but that is really a fun thing to do. It makes you appreciate what a wonderful state we have here and yeah, how many businesses we have. Yeah, clearly those who know you know that you're a natural. You know, you're it, you're you fit right into all of this. And Thanks, man. Appreciate it. So, uh, being in the midst of all of this widespread PPE shortage, you know, we at NC State and NCMEP has been working with a lot of smaller manufacturers who are trying to pivot their operations and to help out more broadly and 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 try to you know make sure we can uh, give our healthcare industry some things that they need. So, what are you hearing for broadly? from small business owners and manufacturers in North Carolina. What's the general mood, you know, amidst all of this? So your timing's impeccable because this morning uh, in our daily email, I actually highlighted a couple of uh, companies that did a quick turnaround and retooled their uh, um, floors to, to kind of help out in this effort. And a couple of them mentioned is uh, EJ Victor 
It's a high-end furniture maker located in Morganton. They're, they're making safety masks, gowns, and even some adjustable cots for their local healthcare community. American Giant, which is another a California-based manufacturer, and they, they specialize in kind of these hoodies, which got really popular. But they have a Middlesex plant here in North Carolina, and they're making medical-grade safety masks. Sylvan Sport, who we all know is a great outdoor uh, gear maker. They do those really cool uh, pull uh, pop-up campers, which, you know, are just, I don't know if you ever looked inside those things, but they're the most the neatest things in the world. They're doing everything. They're making a variety of PPE for counter guards, Tyvek suits, medical tents, all kinds of stuff. And finally, another one's Kitspo, which is a Nashville premium cycling apparel company. Uh, they switched their manufacturing process very quickly to produce safety masks and face shields for area hospitals. And there's many more because I actually asked a bunch of our readers, can you send me some more? And my inbox is filled up. So I'm going to start highlighting some of these manufacturing companies each week, uh, letting people know, that, hey, we're doing some good things here. And we're trying and business is really stepping up to the plate, especially these smaller manufacturers. Now, it's a great thing for these smaller manufacturers because otherwise, it, they there might not be some people that are going to be working because it's it's just a tough road to hoe uh, when you're when you you know when when there's no orders coming in from that standpoint. What I've noticed though, and what I'd like to see more of, is more of a concerted effort amongst our of our manufacturers to not only help out with PPE, but we need to start uh, manufacturing these raw materials, not raw materials, but these 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 parts that go into this, these testing kits. Because what I've heard is. Testing kits can get manufactured and made by some of these companies. That's fine. But some of the things like a swab or something simple like that is hard to come by. The infrastructure that composes some of these things is really tough. If there were an, either a nationwide or concerted effort to get our manufacturers back to produce one thing like that on a, on a huge scale, it's going to help everybody out. One, it's going to put these, a lot of folks back to work. Two, we're going to create more testing. And the more tests that we have across this country – the faster we'll be able to get back to work. And that's key. So we can have everybody tested. We know who's got what, who had what, all that kind of stuff. And it's going to be, you know, we, we need to start testing people that don't have symptoms. You know, and they're starting to do that in New York. I think California maybe as well. We need to start doing it here as well. So, and that, that's really going to be people's minds at ease. We'll know what to do moving forward from that standpoint. It's kind of like the old World War II deal, you know, yeah. right when people got back together. But I, I, I hear that a little bit. And manufacturers, we feel, here in North Carolina, it's, it's taken a bit of a blow. If you look at where we stand in terms of uh, unemployment claims and things like that, you know, because of manufacturing, uh, because of uh, uh, travel and tourism, those industries, and also because of startups and entrepreneurs, uh, we've started a lot of companies since the last recession. And unfortunately, you know, they don't have the stability as much to hunker down during hard times. So, you know, if we, the more we can do to help those kind of companies out, the better. And I think for manufacturing, those, uh, those, those, those materials that go into uh, this, these testing kits would be our next big step. That's great. And it's a, again, there's a big heavy lift there. And again, we're fortunate to be a heavy manufacturing state. So we, we have a lot of uh, small manufacturers who can do some things like that. But, you know, there's the money side of it, too, Ben. Uh, you know, the federal government has recently put out this small business loans as a part of their stimulus package. What are you hearing through your contacts about how these loans are helping? Are, are, are they getting where they need to be? What do you think? We for, for the most part, yes. You know, the first wave went through and it was a little bit confusing in terms of the initial uh, stages of um, getting that set up. But I think this next one that just got approved yesterday by Congress, the president will uh, sign it today and it'll probably get in the works this weekend. From what I'm hearing from our financial uh, contacts, it's going to go through pretty quick. It'll run dry a lot quicker than this last one did. But that's not because the demand's still there, but it's also because the process has gotten a lot smoother. One thing about small business that I was actually talking with the leader of um, a regional bank uh, the, um, the other day, and he, and he said something very, very striking that I thought is one of the problems that small businesses have or had uh, in, the, in the initial stage of this was really getting a handle on their payroll and their accounting. The fact that they couldn't get it all in one place you know, because that's that's where you have to prove what your account, what your what your payroll is, and all this kind of stuff, to to submit it for your application. And a lot of folks just didn't have that in one place and e in an easily get you know easily format to get to. Uh, which which think about it, it makes sense for small businesses. If you're a restaurant, you know you're paying your folks off and things like that. But 
it's not the first thing on your mind. It's basically, you know, producing and all that kind of stuff. So the bookkeeping is extremely important for these small businesses. And that's kind of uh, was a little bit of a, a hardship maybe for them as well. I'm not hearing as much about the larger companies that you hear on the national level, uh, you know, the, the Bruce Chris Steakhouse and stuff like that, uh, getting it. I, I think that's probably, a, it's, it's, when you hear about it, it makes news, but yeah. I'm not sure that that's a huge. I think it's an anomaly. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's Phil, what it is, is it, this is a stop gap for two months. So for two months, it's you, people are covered. Hopefully after in two months, we're going to have a little more clarity in what we're dealing with here. And that, that's what I think it's given people to pause for, which is nice. It's very, it's very much needed. And I, I know that every small business has got, it. it's been very appreciated. Yeah, I was going to ask you, I'm glad you mentioned that too much, you know, I mean, you know, what, you know, that are you, are any of your contacts you talking to you about, you know, what it, what things might look like on the other side of this? I would imagine that that won't be business as usual. A lot of different, uh, yeah, there's still not as much clarity. Uh, a month ago, there was no clarity. Everybody was kind of walking around like in shell shock. Um, there is more clarity now, and I think the fact that in North Carolina, as the governor's talking about possibly going to first stage, first stage of opening things up in about two weeks or so, that'll give people a little more hope and a little more clarity. Until that happens, you're not going to get any kind of decisions uh, from most people in terms of uh, business making decisions. You know, ourself as as the magazine and things like that, we're getting it's a very much a wait and see mode in terms of uh, sponsorships and, and partnerships and things like that for, for B and C. But I think that once you get that, once we get, I would say probably by the you know, mid June, early July, we'll kind of know what we're dealing with a little bit more. I'm optimistic. I think, I don't think we're going to get back to business as usual. I don't think we're ever going to get there as well. But I think that at least we'll be getting back when we get into the fall, at least people out and about in a much more cautious manner, but, 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 but doing business and things. It's, what, it's, it's just going to be very interesting to see how it goes because the more uncertainty you have, no one's doing anything. And that's, that's, I, that's not good for anybody, especially the economy. I expect we'll all be wearing masks for a while. What do you think about that? If they tell us to, and see, that's what people need is clarity in terms of those instructions about what to do. Remember, you know, a month and a half ago, they said masks weren't a big deal. And now it's like, you really should wear a mask. But it's basically because they feel that a a certain amount of people either had it or have it, and it's to protect other people, you know, those kind of things. We really need the clarity across the board in terms of what we're dealing with. Yeah, you know, it's amazing, Ben, you know, we're just talking a little bit now, uh, you know, about how this has kind of affected everything and, and everybody. I mean, you just don't even realize, you know, how far things are reaching. You know, you hear about the sports and all of that, and, and everybody's looking to get back into the sports. But, you know, last time we talked at your podcast, we spoke about the music industry a little bit and music. But, you know, that, there's an effect there as well. I mean, uh, you, don't you think? I mean, uh, yeah. Oh man, listen, I'm telling you, you know, I, the last concert I saw was February, like early February and it was one of the best concerts I've seen in a long time. And all I can think of is looking back on that and go, that might be the very last kind of concert like that, that I'm going to in a while. And I'll tell you why I was kind of a, I'm showing my, what I listened to a little bit, but I'm not, yeah, hey, there you, go. you know what I mean? I don't care. Mm. Um, it's uh, so it's this group called green sky bluegrass and it's basically a bluegrass kind of grateful dead type group. And okay. that type of audience that I saw it in is mashing all up against each other. You know, I think mm-hmm. there's grateful dead, there's deadheads and such. And so especially that type of show is not going to happen, you know, for a while. And that stinks because if you think about all these bands and all these musicians, most of them depend on those shows to make a living. It's not albums anymore because that industry is kind of out the door. So the, the bottom line with this whole thing, Phil, is that everybody, every industry is affected. Even, even ones that you say are doing well, you know, the ones that are doing well are grocery stores, you know, food supply and things like that. They're still being affected. You know, it's still stressful to be yeah. doing what those folks are doing there. Um, yeah, and people are getting sick, you know, at the grocery stores. And so it's amazing. It's just a little bit of anxiety. I think that, like I said, 
you get that testing done and people will know where they stand and how they're going to react. And maybe they had it before and have antibodies or something. That's really, it's, there's your clarity, you know, and that's, that's people because here's the, here's the question that I'm hearing from everybody right now, whatever line of business, even just, just when you kind of talk like we're talking, they're all asking, you know what? I wonder if I had it back in early March, or I wonder if I had this, you know, and chances are they probably had a cold or, you know, or maybe even the flu, but everyone is asking that question. You know what I mean? From that standpoint. And so to have that clarity to know that not only is it going to help out business, it's just going to help the peace of mind of folks. Well, let's talk a little bit more personal. I, I, uh, I saw this weird picture of you. I think it was you and your family. You all had guitars. You know? <laughs> yeah. That was a concert. We were at a concert. Okay. Do yeah, you, we went to go see Brian Setzer, uh, who uh, used to be with the Stray Cats, an old 80s rockabilly band. And now he, uh, and I, this is for the holiday, for the, if the holiday, when the holidays come, he usually has this huge big band with uh, a Christmas show, which is just, it's ridiculous. He plays all his old like rockabilly hits, but he also has like this full orchestra and does kind of rocked out versions of Christmas songs and Santa gets on there. And by the end of it, you know, snow's falling from everywhere and all that kind of stuff. So I don't like to go see that. I hate, I don't like the nutcracker. I'll fall asleep <laughs> when I go see that stuff, you know, but it's kind of like a neat holiday tradition where you can still get your Christmas vibe going. So are you guys musicians? You got, you, you playing it and you play things? In your I play guitar. I have a bunch of guitars, uh, mandolin and such. So I play quite a bit and I was in band in high school and played trombone a lot too. So I uh, love it, man. Believe me, I'm, I, I, music runs through me without a doubt. The rest of the family, not so much. My oldest son, uh, we have a keyboard in, in, in the house and he, he cranks that up now, but he's, he's just trying to do everything from, 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 you know, killing people right now because he, he's a senior yeah. in high school and he's got all kinds of emotions going on right now. I mean, I hate it for him because he's not going to be, you know, he didn't make prom. Uh, he, I, I doubt that they'll be walking down the aisle, you know, in terms of graduating in, in uh, June. So, you know, he's missing out on his senior year and it's just a shame, but you know, he's doing, he's doing really well to keep Biden his time. One of them's playing a lot of music. And so yeah. I heard him cranking up the doors the other day back there. So he's got it. All right, so just a chip off the old block there. Yeah, for better or for worse, buddy. <laughs> well, Ben, you know, we appreciate the time talking with us today. I mean, there's a lot going on, and again, we're all just trying to figure out what to do with these stay-at-home orders, and uh, we're hoping that the next time I see you, it may be out and about somewhere. But uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, Phil, and uh, thanks for all you guys are doing, without a doubt. Like I said, you guys have been great partners we are doing, I think, I think together we're doing some really great things in terms of getting the word out about these manufacturing companies and, and have your folks and your listeners, like I said, anything that you can send me in terms of what your company is doing or a company that you know of uh, to help out in this crisis from a manufacturing perspective, send it to me, bkenny at businessnc.com, and I'll be able to promote it to our Daily Digest readers. And we'll certainly do that, and we'll look forward to your next issue of Business North Carolina Magazine as well. You guys do a great job with that. Again, thanks again, Ben. Thank you, sir. Pleasure. Thank you for joining today's Clocking In, Voices of NC Manufacturing. This podcast is brought to you by NC State's College of Engineering, the North Carolina Manufacturing Extension Partnership, and Industry Expansion Solutions. If you'd like to learn more about the solutions NCMEP offers, go to www.ncmep.org. Want to listen to previous Clocking In podcasts? Go to ncmep.org slash clocking in.